Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 4 for June the 26th, 2016. We begin a new unit today, Unit 2, entitled A World Gone Wrong. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Willful Ignorance Will Lead to Disaster. Willful Ignorance Will Lead to Disaster. Our devotional reading is taken from Psalm 52, our background scripture, Psalm 8, and Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. We will be studying today Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 18 through 23, and verses 28 through 32. Our key verse reads, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. That is taken from Romans chapter 1 verse 20 from the NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to know Paul's limiting uh, story of God's magnificent creation choosing to wreck itself with sin and the second aim is to realize that humans really do have the freedom to be disobedient and the confirmation that God's punishment will follow and the third aim is to discern God's will and follow it we have three outlines that we will be uh, discussing today the first one is entitled God's wrath second outline is entitled nature testifies and the third outline is entitled the reprobate mind we certainly thank and praise God uh, for the privilege the opportunity to be able to share another word with you from our Sunday school lesson one that is uh, plain in its own right uh, very forthright uh, the Apostle Paul explaining uh, to the church at Rome uh, the issues concerning our faith and our conduct. I want to read a little bit of this biblical context from the quarterly. At the time of his writing Paul had never visited Rome. This church was probably started by uh, Jews who were converted on the day of Pentecost. You can see that in Acts chapter 2. Paul opened the book with greetings and thanksgiving and prayer. After these introductory sections, the book may be divided into two sections. While the first section dealt with what a Christian ought to believe, the second section focused on how a Christian ought to behave given these beliefs. In reality, the book of Romans was really Paul's extended discussion about his own faith. He was probably the most qualified to provide an explanation of faith considering his Damascus Road conversion. You can see that in uh, Acts chapter 9. Uh, the book of Romans is the most systematic presentation of theology in the Bible. Paul provided a detailed explanation of what the cross means for every Christian. In so doing, he clarified some basic tenets of Christian belief sin and righteousness, faith and works, and justification and election. Other major themes highlighted in the book of Romans include grace, justification, salvation, spiritual growth, God's sovereignty, and Christian service. I want to touch on just a little bit of the uh, lesson background from our lesson standard to give us a little bit more perspective about uh, uh, what was going on in the church at Rome. Uh, the nature of the church in Rome was influenced by an edict uh, issued by Emperor Claudius about AD 49 that had forced Jews living in the city to leave. You can see that in Acts chapter 18 verse 2. Uh, but throughout this experience, um, this back and forth if you will between uh, Jews and Gentiles, this experience probably fostered a certain division within the Roman church between Gentile 
and Jewish believers, with each group contending that it had better claim on salvation in Christ than did the other. I want you to look at Romans uh, chapter 11, verses 16, I'm sorry, verses 13 through 24. But as we begin our study, uh, uh, we'll be in the book of Romans for the next few weeks. But I want to go back over to the first chapter before we start with these outlines. Um, uh, the first chapter of Romans, and I want to go up to verse 16. This is a, a, a foundation, if you will, uh, for, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I think that's very important uh, for us to understand uh, Paul's um, argument, if you will, concerning uh, God's wrath and, and how we should live. Um, but I was when I was reading this, uh, I just want to share two questions with you today. Number one, can the word of God advise now? Uh, and the second question is what do we really believe? We have gone so far as a society, um, as we discussed in this biblical context, one of the themes of the book of Romans uh, talks about God's sovereignty. Uh, and that is the biblical teaching that God is the source of all creation and that all things come from and depend upon God. I want you to look at Psalm 24 verse 1. So sovereignty means that God is in all and over all. Uh, so as we read this lesson today and as we look at these verses today, uh, let us understand that the Bible speaks for itself. Uh, if we recognize God's word as, a, as the authority, as the sovereign uh, God that he is and that uh, uh, his word is true then the matter whatever matter that we uh, are addressing when the Bible speaks against it or for it uh, the matter should be settled but the problem as we look at this lesson today mankind questions the Bible's authenticity that is an issue we're going to talk about that a little bit today uh, because as we get into these uh, uh, character traits, if you will, because of God's wrath has, has come up on us and we have not uh, uh, reverenced the word of God uh, as we should. So let us begin. Uh, God's wrath is the first outline taken from Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 18. I want to read this from the NIV translation. The Bible says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness or all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. What is Paul saying here? That after the introductory section, uh, verses 1 through 15, Paul provided his personal theology an overall message of his preaching in verses 16 and 17, the gospel of Christ and salvation by faith. Uh, he then quickly transitioned into his first theological discussion, God's wrath toward unrighteousness. Paul addressed unrighteousness for Gentiles, Jews, and all, all humankind. He began here with the Gentiles. God simply didn't, did not or does not like sin. Sin is out and out rebellion against God. But uh, the word wrath appropriate in describing God's attitude towards sin. In human terms, wrath is a very negative word with synonyms like aggravation, irritation, and indignation. These are obviously not words we would associate with God. We can complete Paul's description of the gospel as the power of God unto salvation by adding from unrighteousness. 
Thus, the very preaching of the gospel reveals God's wrath against sin. Let me just stop here. Why do we question the word of God concerning sin? Why do we have so many different interpretations of what God's feeling is about a particular sin? And as we get into these uh, uh, descriptions of, of the types or character traits of the types of sin, why can't we just accept the fact that God is against it? Why do we need a different interpretation other than the one that the Bible is giving us? If God is holy, we know that he is, and he is against uh, 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 particular things, a uh, uh, sin, if you will, that does not ascribe to his nature. Who can dispute that? It goes on to say Paul made it clear about the reason for God's wrath. Humankind's godlessness and wickedness. Being a godless person encompasses more than just being someone who does not believe in God, but much more. This is a person who not only does not believe in God, but also openly and deliberately opposes God. If left unchecked, godless people may gain a foothold, leading many to stray from God. Being wicked is more than doing evil. An evil person is a person whose evil actions both harm another individual and distort the very fabric of society. Both godless and wicked actions suppress the truth. Uh, in verse 18b, the NIV translation, uh, God is caring, uh, loving, worthy of human beings, praise, and worship. So here again, uh, we see that God is against ungodliness. Anything, it doesn't matter uh, what type of unrighteousness that it is. All unrighteousness is sin. It doesn't matter uh, uh, what type it is. There is no good sin and there is no bad sin, if you will. All unrighteousness is sin. And we have to understand that because we bring this up on ourselves when we fail to adhere and appreciate uh, what the Word of God is saying against the nature of sin. Uh, men need to be saved from these things and this is the purpose by which the gospel comes to us. This was the purpose for Christ dying on the cross. It was to address the sin problem committed by Adam and Eve in the garden. So after mankind was kicked out of the garden, uh, they were uh, out of fellowship, separated from the place that God wanted them to be. Christ coming into this world, uh, living in this world, the Bible said that there was no sin found in him, there was no darkness in him at all. He represented the second Adam. And then thus dying on the cross and shedding his sinless blood, he was able to secure salvation for the rest of us or for all humanity that we could have fellowship with God again through his sacrifice. So we, we have to understand these things. Romans chapter 6, I believe, helps us to understand the type of death that Jesus died. He died a death to sin. But failure to adhere to these principles of, of theology, of doctrine, uh, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is an affront to the grace and the mercy of God. Again, back over in Romans chapter 6, I believe verse 1, Paul asks a question. Are we, are we to remain in sin that grace may abound? He says, may it never be. So I hope we understand. And as we get a little bit further uh, uh, into this lesson today, as Paul itemizes these things, uh, and certainly they are not inclusive, but they help us to understand these things that God is against. Our second outline is entitled, Nature Testified. This is taken from Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Again, from the NIV translation. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. 
For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So again here Paul is giving more evidence through creation that we should understand that God made these things. Genesis tells us that what he created. If you look at Psalm 19 the, uh, the, the Bible says over there that the heavens are declaring the glory of the Lord. So when you look up when you see the stars when you see the moon uh, uh, when you see the clouds when you see the rain and all of these other things uh, uh, what do you think and, and where do you think these things come from uh, we know that these are not man made things these are God's invisible uh, uh, his invisible power made manifest through his creation that we might be able to see when you look up in the sky you see God's creation stretched over your head uh, when you look at the earth as far as the east is from the west we see uh, God's creation manifest uh, his power when you look at the seas and the rivers and and all of nature how God has put these things together so this tells us that God exists this tells us that his power is clearly seen by all of us and we have experienced it and we have been harmed by it so we understand these things that God has made these things so then man is without excuse uh, because he, God expects us to give him thanks. He, ex not a, just ex he expects us not to just say these things, but to live thankfully and gratefully. But man, in turn, worships uh, uh, creations as though they uh, 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 brought themselves, in, themselves into being. You know, when I was thinking about that, uh, this verse and these, these verses here, I thought about the Old Testament. Uh, you recall uh, all of the Baals that the uh, Canaanite nation uh, was worshiping. They had gods for, uh, uh, they made gods out of the sun and the moon uh, and the stars. They had other idols that they carried around that they worshiped. And all of these things provoke God to anger. We need to keep that in mind today. You can make an idol out of anything. And when that idol takes the place of God, Joshua helps us to understand in his book that God is a jealous God. Uh, he, he will not share his glory with another. So when we create these things and we worship these things uh, other than God, we should understand that uh, uh, we are provoking God. And this is the thing that uh, uh, renders us without an excuse. But since... Uh, uh, Paul knew that his epistle would reach a wide audience, including non-Jews. He advanced his argument to su in support of God's wrath against unrighteousness by looking at nature. Although God used the Bible to provide direct revelation about himself, the natural world could testify plainly against godlessness. Creation itself is proof positive of God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, the triune Godhead. In other words, Paul was describing God's sovereignty. He alone had the power not only to create the world, but also to keep it functioning. It was foolhardy to claim that there was no God. The secular thinking people of the world had to know that they were without excuse. Since these non-Jews knew that God existed, they should have glorified God for his handiwork and thanked him for maintaining the natural order of things. All of humankind should be thankful to God for his handiwork. After all, the seas had not overtaken the land, nor had the moon fallen into the earth. Instead, some extremely secular thinking humans let their imaginations run wild, hardening their hearts toward any belief in the sovereign God. Truth be told, even if they 
were not going to worship God, the least they could have done was to acknowledge him with a sense of thanksgiving. As believers, we must be careful not to forget to thank God for everything. As the creator, God of all things, including humankind, he is worthy of all our thanks, even for the smallest blessing. You know, it's very important as we read the foundation of the Bible. That's why we read uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 initially uh, uh, at this lesson because it, it establishes ourselves as believers. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We should not be ashamed of what it says uh, and what it tells us uh, we should do concerning God and concerning our fellow man. This is the foundation of our faith. So Paul even in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 he gives Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 uh, in the Old Testament to help us to understand that the just those of us that are just before God justified uh, uh, we live by faith the just shall live so we live by faith in other words we live by believing that God's word is valid we believe wholeheartedly this is how we are saved uh, and we believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so after, after we have accepted these basics in the truth of the gospel, then we include every fabric uh, from Genesis to Revelation uh, as the Lord would provide into our lives that we might understand that this is what we uh, believe and this is what we intend to adhere to. Uh, quoting scriptures is good. But if we don't believe them so as to obey them, Jesus uh, says these words throughout the book of John, but particularly in um, John 14 and John 15. If you loved me, Jesus says to his disciples, you will keep my commandments. We need to keep these things in mind because as we get a little bit deeper uh, in this lesson and we start dealing with some of the issues of sin that we're looking at even today, if we uh, uh, agree with the theologians uh, that that tell us that this uh, uh, passage of scripture here, this uh, epistle to the church at Rome, uh, was written some di some time in A.D. 58. Some scholars place it a little bit earlier, but look how relevant it is today as we get into this next outline talking about the reprobate mind. But the question is asked here in the quarterly. At its heart, pagan worship is the worship of an aspect of creation instead of the creator. Using this definition, what are some modern day examples of idol gods? As we said earlier, they can you can make a god out of anything. And anything that we put in the place of God, we should understand that he will not, God will not share his glory with another. Uh, the Old Testament is classic. Uh, for this, uh, this is one of even the Ten Commandments. God says to the children of Israel, You shall have no other gods before me or besides me. Keep that in mind. The reprobate mind, this is taken from Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, again from the NIV translation. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God uh, uh, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Verse 29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You know, let me say this. As we seek today, even in our society, to explain the cause of the negative behavior, the sin in our communities that are running rampant. 
everywhere all over this land and country. No reporter will tell you it's because of sin. Most people will try to give a political view. Uh, we will seek to discuss uh, all of the attributes of a person's life that caused them to do wrong. But when we look at the Bible, what does the Bible tell us about such actions? What is the Bible telling us the reason for these behaviors are? Do we believe this? Do we understand this? And do we recognize the fact that our failure to obey God is the cause of our trouble today? Will we accept these principles that the sovereign God of all creation is giving us reason after reason even through sin as we look at these things you can match these sins to what we see in society today and and instead of man saying God has already spoken out against these things and we should uh, depart from evil and do good then uh, you know we try to explain it another way and we never address the fact that God has already said don't do it and if he tells us not to do it and we and we overstep the word of God, which is what we're doing, we are violating the commandments of God and we are paying for it with our very lives. Our children are paying for it and we expect it. We expect things to get better and we are not going to obey the Lord. How can this be? So God says, I'm going to move out of your way. This is what Paul is saying here. This is what the, uh, the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write. God is saying, I'm going to move out of your way and just let you run your course. Let you be you. Let you be grown. Let you do things your way. And you're going to see that my word is true, even through the conviction of your own sin. So we need to understand these things about God. These uh, uh, attributes, God, let us understand this. Uh, James chapter 1 said, God is not... Uh, uh, the author of our sin he's not causing it he's allowing you in his permissive will to disobey him and thus you will be compensated for that disobedience we need to understand that it is God's perfect will that we be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth but God has blessed us with free will to make decisions and to make choices in this life after we have read the Bible the Bible tells us I believe in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death it is death but the gift of God is eternal life which we have through Jesus Christ our Lord so Paul here gives an itemized list because some in Paul's day and also today they thought and they think uh, they knew and know it all. God allowed and allows them continue to continue in their backward thinking. He allowed them to reap the consequences of immoral living. Because they rejected any knowledge of God from nature, their immoral living led to their having reprobate, depraved minds. In other words, human beings were still doing what they think they are big enough and bad enough to do. I like this, uh, uh, this comment here. It says, sin originates in the mind. Matthew chapter 15 verse 19. And then it goes on to say, the act of sin is always the product of an active thinking process. Do we understand that? The reason why that we sin, this is beautiful, the act of sin is always the product of an active thinking process. Something is going on with the minds of individuals that they are thinking about and being overtaken by their own lust to do evil and it, it, it becomes manifest uh, in our culture and in our society to all the things that we read and there's more that Paul goes on to say here uh, in being specific uh, uh, in some of this depraved thinking with a comprehensive list, though not meant to be complete of sins, if we examine Paul's listing carefully, we see that there are general categories of sin. The first one in these general categories are wickedness, 
evil, greed, depravity, envy. The second, direct sins against others, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, disobeying of their parents. Thirdly, indirect sins against others. Uh, those are gossips, slanderers, insolent, direct sins against God. God haters, arrogant and boastful, having no understanding. And then the fifth one, uncaring sins, no fidelity, untrustworthy, no love, no mercy. You know, uh, we see all of these things today. And in and, and this case, you know, what I love about God's word. It's settled whether we believe it or not because he said it and whatever he says, it will come to pass. Whatever he has spoken out, uh, uh, Isaiah tells us that his, his word will not come back to him void. So we are going to continue. If we read our Bibles and I challenge all of you to read Romans chapter one, if you ever want to know, don't listen to all of these different things that are contrary to the word of God. Read the Bible for yourself. And when you match these conditions and these spirits with the things that God has said, we have our answers in our hands that God says this is the reason why we are experiencing this. So what do we do about this? I'm glad you asked. The good news in all of this is that Jesus Christ came into this world to save us from our sin. There is relief. There is a way out. This is why we preach the gospel. We have the, the antidote to the crisis in society. The antidote is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The antidote, the cure-all for our unrighteousness is the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost that keeps us. Uh, Jude tells us in his benediction, now unto him who was able to keep you from falling. Man has to recognize this. Uh, as Jesus says in the 15th chapter of John, apart from me, ye can do nothing. We need to stop trying to keep ourselves and govern ourselves. We are part of the creation of God and we are depending on him. God created that dependency that he would keep us. He is the only one that can keep you and I from falling. The only thing that is keeping us, even as saved individuals, is the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the only one that restrains and keeps us on that straight and narrow. He tells us, don't do this, don't do that. He gives us the power to endure temptation uh, and the onslaught of evil desire. He is the only one that can save us from our sins. And as we seek uh, 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 in society today to find another way to get ourselves out of this situation. When the Bible is telling us, God is saying, Jesus said these words in the 11th chapter of Matthew. He said, come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens of life are light. Why don't we come to Jesus? If you're sick in sin, come to Jesus. If you don't know what to do with the members of your body and you don't know what to do with the thoughts that you have, come bring it to Jesus. Lay your case at the feet of Jesus and plead for the mercy of God. Repent of your sin. Call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. He will deliver you. This is the fabric of what we believe. This is the foundation of salvation. We must confess that Jesus is the Christ. If we confess with our mouth. And believe in our hearts. That God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 10 declares unto us. That we will be saved. I love this here. I tell you. I'm getting so much out of this. But we go on to uh, read a little bit more of this. Uh, when they got tired. Of the usual types of sin they would invent ways of doing evil. Do you see that in society today? We are coming up with things that, 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 that our parents have never heard of and have never seen. Generations before us didn't do, but now we are doing these things. That reminds us of that evil actions occurring daily in the world today. 
In the closing verse of chapter 1, Paul made it clear that these evildoers knew that sinning in these ways deserved death. Yet even with the knowledge that these sins deserved death, humankind did not only continue to do these very things, but also approved of those who practiced them. Really, every believer and non-believer knows that certain things are just wrong. When we do not speak against such actions, we are condoning such practices. Speaking against evil might not be the most popular thing to do, yet Paul made it clear that we ought not to be ashamed to share the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and again adding from unrighteousness. The case is settled. It sounds like to me we need a savior. Sounds like to me we need help. It sounds like to me we need to make a 911 call to Jesus that he might save us. If you are unsaved today, I plead with you today to give your life to Christ. Don't don't just turn over some things uh, 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 to the Lord. But the Bible is clear. If you seek the Lord with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, you will find what you're looking for. If you call on the name of Jesus, I declare unto you today, he will answer prayer. I hope, trust, and pray that we have given you something to think about. And and, and as we look at this lesson today, uh, I hope that you are encouraged today. Uh, don't throw your lot in with evildoers. If you are, 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 are seeing these kinds of things that you know are against uh, your faith and against what the Lord is teaching us, we have an obligation as ministers of God to speak out against all unrighteousness. We're not condemning the people. We are condemning the sin. We are condemning the actions. The people need to be saved. And they are are doing the things that they are doing because they are devoid of salvation that Jesus brought and, and gave his life. Precious blood was shed for our sins that we might be saved. I want to offer this closing prayer that uh, that is in our lesson today. Creator God, we pause as humbly as we know how just to offer you thanks for your handiwork in creating the whole world, the universe, and humankind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, until such time that the Lord will bless us to come together again, we say God bless you.